Hello and welcome back to Touring 360. Today we are at a lesser known English heritage site which sits in the shadow of the Palace of Westminster. It's the medieval building known as the Jewel Tower. In 1834, a huge fire swept through part of London, destroying much of the medieval Palace of Westminster. One of the buildings that did remain intact, however, was the Jewel Tower. Built between 1365 and 1366 at the southern end of the Palace of Westminster, which had been the main residence of medieval kings since the 11th century, the area was known as the Privy Palace and was a complex of a hall, chambers and chapels for the royal family. The Jewel Tower stood at the western end of a garden and was defended by a moat which was directly linked to the River Thames. The building works were completed by Master Mason Henry Yavell and the Master Carpenter Hugh Herland and was completed within a year. Jewel Tower stood at the southwest corner of a small royal garden within the Privy Palace, the innermost area that contained the chambers of the King and Queen. Starting our exploration on the second floor, the entrance to the main room from the stairwell holds an important clue as to the intended function. Its wooden door with iron studs and eight thick vertical boards is probably the original door, a remarkable survival from the 14th century. but the stone door frame shows that there was originally a second door opening outwards into the stairwell from hinges on the western side. The double doors were both originally secured with bars and locks. In 1366, the locksmith John Halfmark supplied 18 locks for the doors in this tower and elsewhere in the palace. These doors show that it was on the top floor that the most valuable items were stored. The Pix Chamber in Westminster Abbey Cloister, similarly used as a royal treasury, still retains its two 14th century doors. The windows on this floor were given additional protection by wooden shutters fitted in rebates inside the windows themselves. This space appears to have been routinely manned in the Middle Ages. The fireplace kept the room warm and in the south wall of the smaller room was a low arch that originally led to a latrine. Visitors in the later 14th century would almost certainly have found a room largely filled with wooden chests, each of them with its own lock, in which the keeper and his attendants kept the jewels and plates under their charge. Medieval kings possessed several other treasuries in the City of London and Westminster, two of which survive today. The White Tower at the centre of the Tower of London and the Pix Chamber in Westminster Abbey. The crowns and coronation vestments were divided between the two sites. The new jewel tower held items of the king's personal treasure rather than what we would call the crown jewels. In the mid-16th century, this floor was filled with assorted items belonging to King Henry VIII and his family, but for a hundred years thereafter, its history is unknown. Although documents were kept on the floor below through the 17th and early 18th centuries, these upper rooms seem to have been left empty. Only in 1719 were they commandeered for record storage and fitted out with cupboards and shelves. The Acts of Parliament were kept in the smaller room, while clerks worked in a larger space in front of the fire. This raised fears that a conflagration might spread from the larger room into the smaller. The partition between them was still a timber screen or spear of 1366, made by the carpenter Richard of Burnham. The present brick wall with a Gothic stone door was built in 1726 as a precaution against such an incident. Although much of the medieval roof was irreparably damaged during the Second World War, when in May 1941 the building was struck by incendiary bombs, in fact it had already needed substantial repairs in the 1860s. The present roof, installed in the spring of 1949, gives an excellent impression of the lost medieval original. The middle floor of the Jewel Tower, like the rooms above, was originally used for the storage of items held by the Royal Wardrobe. Its east window contains surviving fragments of medieval window seats and its mutilated fireplace bears evidence for its original moulded mantelpiece. However, as we see it today, this floor shows the greatest level of alteration during the 17th and 18th centuries when the upper parts of the tower were used by clerks at the Parliament's office. The main room is covered by a shallow vault of Portland stone. The date of the vault's construction is uncertain, 
but it has been suggested that this relates to a documented payment in 1753 of £350, which is almost £30,000 today. The purpose of this vault was to protect against fire. Earlier in the century, the large east window was reconstructed and four further windows were created in order to increase natural light into the interiors. By the beginning of the 18th century, both rooms on the first floor were being used for storage of the records of the House of Lords, mostly written on parchment and paper vulnerable to fire from candles or lamps. In July 1718, a committee reported that the quantity of documents in these two rooms had become unmanageable and directed that the two rooms above, then vacant, should be fitted out to receive them. The smaller room bears evidence of similarly motivated building works in 1621. In fact, the Parliament Office had been using the tower to store records since at least the reign of Elizabeth I, 1557 to 1603. But in this year, as part of a general review of the keeping of records, the Lords gave orders for building works to adapt the medieval tower for this function. The bricklayer Thomas Hicks received £6, about £575 today, to build the vault over a smaller room where the records of Parliament are kept and to cover it with mortar. Also in 1629, an iron door was made for the doorway leading into the larger room of the tower. This still bears the date and a beautiful lock with the cipher IR, Jacobus Rex, for King James I, 1603-1625. The presence of such a fireproof door implies that the partition in which it stood was changed from timber to masonry at the same time, or even at some previous date. The iron window shutter in the smaller room dates to 1719 and is the sole survivor of a number of similar additions made in that year and in 1726 on the floor above. The east window had a chequered history. In the mid 18th century, when a house adjoining the tower was rebuilt, it was decided to convert it into the principal doorway to the first floor of the tower. At this time, the lowest treads of the medieval spiral stair were removed. In 1953, the ancient monuments branch of the Ministry of Works restored it as a window, internally in medieval style, but externally as an 18th century arch, as shown in a sketch of around 1720. The arched recess beside the east window originally contained the seat of a medieval latrine, which discharged via a chute into the moat. In 1719, the recess was converted into a fireplace, later blocked, and it was likewise restored to its medieval form in 1953. The 15th century Black Book of Westminster Abbey recorded the monks' anger at the seizure of their land for the construction of the jewel tower and its moat, and the divine retribution that struck the perpetrator. The book also contains a similar story of how the builders disturbed the remains of a hermitage and the lead coffin of the hermit, and were likewise punished for their impiety. It tells how, in the time of King Edward III, a certain keeper of the Lord King's palace named William Ushbourne unjustly seized for the King's use a certain close belonging to the Prior of Westminster, and here he made a garden with a pond in which to keep live fish. It so happened that one day, around the feast of St Peter Ad Vincula, he invited some of his Westminster neighbours to dinner, and he prepared his table with a large pike caught in this fish pond. As they all sat down to dinner, this William quickly took some of the pike, but as soon as he had swallowed two or three mouthfuls of the fish, he began shouting wildly in these words. It's trying to choke me! After crying out in pain many times in this way, he suddenly fell to the ground and died a wretched death without the last rites. He was then carried into the parish church of St Margaret, and because of the dignity of his office, he was buried in the choir. It was said that this came to pass because he had confiscated for the use of King Edward III the meadow and garden of the infirmary and the prior of Westminster's garden. The main room on the ground floor, entered by the door to the left of the spiral stair, is one of the most impressive medieval interiors in London. With its magnificent vault, it demonstrates the outstandingly high quality in design and construction that the medieval crown could command even for a building not intended to be widely seen. Like the two floors above it, the ground floor comprises a large rectangular room running north-south 
and a similar space in a turret on the eastern side, communicating with the southern end of the main room. The vault, which springs from half octagonal shafts along the walls with moulded capitals and bases, now mostly decayed, incorporates tiercerons, intermediate ribs set between the transverse and the diagonal ribs forming simple fans. The master mason responsible for building the jewel tower, Henry Yeville, who died in 1400, had been since 1360 the disposer of the king's works of masonry in the Palace of Westminster and the Tower of London, commissioning works in both places, and his brother Robert had in 1361 built a similar vault in the Bloody Tower at the Tower of London. The Jewel Tower is a precious survival of the medieval Palace of Westminster. Although it bears obvious signs of alteration, particularly in the early 18th century, much of what can be seen today has survived from the 1360s, and the essential form of the building, with a main block and a turret projecting eastwards from its southern end, has never changed. Moreover, between 1954 and 1968, the demolition of surrounding buildings, landscaping works and archaeological investigations brought to light several important features of the building's setting. The Jewel Tower was mostly built with stone from the local area around London. Much of the facing stone is from the area of Maidstone in Kent, the famous ragstone used in buildings all over London and the South East. It is notable that the builders used varying qualities of stonework for different elevations, the wall containing the entrance door and the adjoining wall to the left, originally facing into the palace garden, were built with roughly coursed masonry, whereas the other, outward facing walls, were of finely squared blocks. The original doors and windows were made in grey green Rygate stone, mined underground in Surrey. This stone becomes powdery after long exposure, explaining why in the 18th century these all needed replacement. Sadly, no record of their medieval form has survived but the three east-facing windows in the main block were very large and would have incorporated stone tracery in the perpendicular Gothic style. Beer stone from Devon and a small amount of fine stone from Caen, Normandy, were used for string horses and gargoyles, now lost. These were replaced by a straight brick parapet capped with Portland stone during the repairs of 1718-19 when the windows were reconstructed with their present round or three-centred heads. The brick turret over the spiral stair dates to the same years. The small windows in the staircase turret have a distinctive shape with semicircles projecting above and below a rectangular opening. There are parallels for this in the Hensington Gates at Blenheim Palace and St Anne's Church in Limehouse, London, both designed by the architect Nicholas Hawksmoor, who died in 1736. This suggests that Hawksmoor, serving in 1717 as Secretary to the Board of Works and Clerk of Works at Westminster, Whitehall and St James's Palace, devised at least some of the new features of the Jewel Tower. So that brings us to the end of another walk through London's hidden history. We really hope you've enjoyed today's film, and if you have, please like and subscribe and let us know in the comments what or where you want us to explore next. We really want your input so we can make this the channel you want it to be. So let us know what you like, what you don't, what you think, and what you want to see. Until next time then.